Okay, so this is lecture 20, and today we're going to look at supervised analysis with um, uh, linear regression to predict, uh, well, a simple model for predicting breast cancer, patient outcome, uh, the time to um, death uh, post diagnosis. Um, yeah, so we're going to look at some regression models, uh, and I think if you recall, we talked about this a little bit uh, in lecture six. At that time, we weren't predicting uh, patient outcome, but we're classifying tissue type uh, that was normal versus tumor for an individual. But in, in principle, the same um, mathematics um, statistics are used in both cases. It's just the response variable endpoint that changes. Well, actually, in um, uh, clinical practice, uh, this is one area where computational biology has had a huge impact, uh, and that's the development of gene marker panels. Um, probably the classic example of this, well, there's like maybe two classic examples. One is Oncotype DX, and the other is Mammoprint. Oncotype DX was uh, developed in the United States, whereas Mammoprint was from Holland, primarily. Um, so the basic idea of Oncotype DX is um, to predict whether a patient will benefit from um, uh, chemotherapy in uh, a certain type of breast cancer, those that are ER positive, uh, and there's other conditions on when the test would be used. But suffice it to say here, in um, ER positive breast cancers, uh, the woman will probably be given an anti, uh, um, uh, an, 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 something like tamoxifen, uh, something that's targeting estrogen, uh, there's different ways to do that, but primarily tamoxifen. And then they might also receive chemotherapy uh, at the same time as the tamoxifen. Now, it's not been very clear at, at, to, to clinical oncologists when uh, and if they should give chemotherapy, whether the patient benefits from it above and beyond what they would receive from tamoxifen. And that's where um, genomics and computational biology has come in. And um, Oncotype DX uh, is a RT-PCR-based assay. It involves 21 genes. They're listed here, five of which are controls, references, um, that are used to, in some sense, normalize the data. Uh, a strength of the assay is it works in FFPE. So basically, that means uh, it's, it's convenient for a hospital to remove or biopsy a woman's tumor and fix it in this very stable material and send it basically by post to um, uh, a center where it's processed by a company called Genomic Health. And these 21 genes are combined by an algorithm, a formula down here. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but as you probably know by now, um, since we've talked about it so much, is that there's a factor, um, some genes, HER2 and GRAB7, that are representing the um, HER2 positive breast cancer. There's a, a bunch of genes that are looking at um, ER positivity, um, it's progesterone receptor, estrogen receptor, BCL2, um, we're going to talk about that again today, and then the proliferation group, which we talked a little bit about, KI67, uh, etc., and, and then an invasion group. So there's different biologies that are combined in the recurrence score, the RS, what it's called, and basically these are the factors here that are um, uh, that are multiplying these different groups and overall you get a score between I believe 0 and 100 and I'll show you a slide in a second but that score uh, represents um, in a sense the uh, likelihood you might say that the woman will benefit from chemotherapy uh, so this was a really famous plot put, put out I believe in 2006 that showed that um, Oncotype DX had clinical utility, right? So, in other words, it would actually affect clinical decision-making. Okay, so it's, these are our so-called Kaplan-Meier curves, something we haven't looked at in the course, but are very common, especially in disease studies, like cancer, where patients are uh, perhaps um, dying or falling out of the study as time goes by. So in this case here, you see that it was a very long study, 12 years, that's um, extremely long for breast cancer, in fact. And on the y-axis here, you have uh, the percent of cohort, or the fraction of cohort, in fact, or one, that is surviving at that time point. So at the beginning, of course, 
all, all patients are surviving, so that's one. But as we move along uh, these two curves, you can see that they're dropping towards zero because patients are either dropping out of the study, meaning that they're no longer participating, so they're censured, or um, they're, they're, they're um, recurring, and so they're events that are, that are happening. Now, in this case here, we have two curves. This is across all patients in the study, and um, which I think was 400, it rep the blue curve represents 400 patients and the red curve represents just over 200. And, and you can see that as you go through time, by the time you get to around five years, um, those patients that received just uh, tamoxifen and chemotherapy, the blue people, uh, about 95% of them are surviving and uh, about 90% of the um, individuals who just received tamoxifen are surviving. Now, in fact, uh, what's called a log rank test is used to determine whether these two curves are actually significantly different. So, for example, here, these two curves don't look to be significantly different, they're crossing over. But down here, you see that they are very, there's a big gap between them. Likewise here, they're not, uh, they're not very different. So that log rank test measures the statistical evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the two curves are the same. So here, in fact, uh, in what we would call unstratified analysis, this is just all patients stratified only by their treatment, it's already significant, but um, you can see that there is a gap between those two. And um, well, definitely those, some of those patients that receive both chemo and tamoxifen are doing better. Now, so this, this ends up being a sort of clinical conundrum. So what do you do clinically? Do you give every patient um, uh, tamoxifen? So in other words, you remove the dotted red line by just giving, uh, oh, sorry, did I say tamoxifen? Okay, I meant you just give every patient chemo also. That would then erase this red line and, and all patients, all 650 patients would be on this blue line. Now, um, Clearly, 90% uh, of these patients, even out here, at maybe that's about 85%, 87% of patients after 12 years, they don't need, need chemotherapy. So it would represent a lot. So in other words, there's a lot of patients um, uh, at 12 years that did just fine without chemotherapy. So giving everybody chemotherapy is, you know, a, a good amount of over-treatment, right? And, of course, there's a lot of reasons not to want chemotherapy. I mean, it's not very comfortable, that's for sure. It also increases your risk, um, your lifetime risk of lymphomas and other types of cancers downstream. So it's a pretty severe treatment, um, and you don't really want to take it if you don't need to. That's the social um, you know, the issues around chemotherapy. Of, of course, there's also economic issues, and uh, you know, chemotherapy costs the healthcare system and the family. Uh, quite a bit of money, right? I mean, it's it's multiple visits to a hospital. It's the drug itself or drugs, really. It's usually a cocktail of things. It's nurses and hospital beds, etc. And of course, a dollar spent on chemotherapy needlessly is a dollar that's not spent, say, you know, on a patient treatment uh, where it could have a bigger impact. So, uh, you know, the economic factors are part of the moral equation, right? And we want to save money so that we can use our, our limited budgets in more um, effective ways. So what Oncotype DX does is they, they you, you basically, when the woman comes in at time of diagnosis, they would take a sample of the tumor, say by uh, biopsy or, or maybe even surgery, and they take that material and they send it to a comp this company, Genomic Health, and they pay several thousand dollars to have this assay done on the previous page. So basically, um, they do 21 RT-PCR reactions in the FFPE with lots of controls, et cetera. It's a pretty robust pipeline, I would imagine. And they apply this formula to get this RS score. And then this RS score in this B, C, and D is used to stratify the patients. So here, these are um, patients A, that, uh, sorry, in, in B are low risk. So their recurrence score is below 18. So these patients are considered by um, Oncotype DX to be at low risk of recurrence. And therefore, the argument would be that they don't need tamoxifen. These patients 
have a recurrent score between uh, 18 and 30. Okay, so they're, they're intermediate. And finally, these patients over here have high uh, uh, recurrent scores above, I think, 31. So they're, they're considered to be at high risk of recurrence. So essentially, if we go back to the signature, um, I think that we've had enough discussion now that you have some insight into this. Markers like KI67, Survivin, uh, Cyclin B, etc. They're, they're measuring how proliferative the tumor is. We know um, that you know, estrogen positive tumors are a different type of breast cancer than say HER2 positive or HER2 negative, ER negative, the so-called triple negatives, et cetera. So, so this, this oncotype DX is in a sense, you know, poetically touching on different aspects of a tumor and trying to make a call. And if you stare at this equation long enough, it kind of makes sense some intuitively why these specific coefficients. So now, if the woman um, whose you know whose tumor has been sampled and assayed, if uh, the idea would be that if the oncotype type DX says well it's below 16, um, 18, then that person won't receive um, chemotherapy. Now in the middle, for a long time, actually until maybe about uh, two years ago at the AACR meeting in Chicago, uh, did they actually announce that officially that. Um, uh, how oncotype beha behaves on this middle group of scores between 18 and 31. And it turns out it actually it does work, but uh, this was the original graph from 2006. And this group over here uh, in D are high risk, and so they would get uh, chemotherapy. Now in this study here, patients, this is a, I believe a randomized trial, so they were either given or not given um, the drug, and so this, you know, this was before oncotype DX was approved. And you can see that, in fact, um, when you draw the Kaplan-Meier curves in just the patients that had low RS scores, recurrent scores, there is no difference in their survival rate. It's very high in both cases, and the p-value reflects that they're not different at 0.61. In the mixed group here, you see um, that they also uh, have a high p-value. You can't reject the null hypothesis, and so. Um, there's no, uh, there's no reason uh, here to suggest that if a patient has a moderate RS score that they should receive um, uh, Oncotype DX. Now the numbers here are relatively small at 89 and 45 compared to 218 and 135, but this was a, the first study uh, that's been now investigated at much uh, in the Taylor X trial with tens of, uh, literally 15,000 patients I believe. Now here in D, uh, you see there's a big, big gap and the p-value reflects that it's far below 0 0.01 uh, between those got tamoxifen and chemo who have an overall survival rate of 12 years of around just below 90% uh, and you know something that's around just below 60%. So that, that's a big gap, right? So uh, those patients that only received tamoxifen were clearly undertreated. And, and that really set the stage for using Oncotype DX in clinics around, well, mostly the United States, and now it started in Canada. It, it was used sort of um, ad hoc ways in Quebec for a long time. I'm not sure the status now of whether it's co covered by health insurance, but um, Ontario, it's covered for sure. And I believe it's covered by health insurance in Quebec if you fit certain criteria where the clinician really can't make a good judgment as to whether or not to assign chemotherapy to the patient. Across the United States, it's used very um, uh, quite a bit. It's standard of care. Uh, there's an alternative. Well, there's actually, I think, three or four alternatives now. Uh, Swiss one also, uh, I think it's called EndoPredict, and then there's maybe um, a couple other ones uh, in Europe, I, I believe, and one from actually Vancouver and Chuck Peru's lab with um, a, a researcher, a pathologist at UBC, Torsten Nielsen, who created the uh, Prosignia based on the PAM50 subtypes that we looked at last class. And in that case, they're really, I think it's fair to say that Prosignia is really stratifying between luminal A and luminal B patients, which you'd have some uh, passing familiar, familiarity with at this point. And in Prosignia, one of the, why is that relevant? Well, one of the big things between luminal A and luminal B is the proliferative index of the, of the tumor how fast it's evolving. And um, uh, 
that kind of makes sense, right? So it's used in kind of a similar way to Oncotype DX. Now, in fact, the first technique that was out there, I believe, um, was from Laura Vantavir, uh, and Steve Friend's lab, um, and that was 2002, and this was published in Nature. Uh, the link is right here if you want to check that paper out. Uh, there's, there originally were microarray based. So in this figure here, each row is a tumor. And they had around 80 tumors, okay? And each column is a gene that they selected. I think that this is basically 80 genes, if I recall correctly. Maybe it's 78 or something, okay? And, and so uh, this is not RNA-seq data. This predated RNA-seq, but here this is a microarray. The same principle. Red means that the gene is overexpressed compared to its median. Um, and green means it's underexpressed. Black means that it's basically at the median level. And so, so you can see, um, yeah, that there's pattern here. There's genes that are very up down here, and th those genes are very down in these same, um, uh, in the same cohort of patients at the bottom here. Okay, I ignore this for now. Okay, uh, but and then over here, what you have is the correlation to good prognosis. Um, okay, so these patients up here are basically good outcome. All these patients, right? And, and that's marked by black here, so they didn't have a metastasis. Now, in their case, they were looking at uh, younger patients, 55 years old, small tumors that were lymph node negative. This is where you would have problems trying to decide whether the person should or shouldn't receive chemotherapy. Um, their their um, endpoint was prognosis, so th we, they distinguished between those that um, had a distant metastasis within five years versus uh, no distant metastasis, okay? So basically here, these, this, this, this vector, right, of, of values, uh, green followed by red, is highly correlated with good prognosis. And um, the idea would be that they, they draw this line in the sand, this solid yellow land, line, and, and basically patients that are above the um, solid yellow line are predicted as good outcome. And, and I, again, the clinical utility that translates to a clinical utility where you wouldn't assign chemotherapy. And patients below this yellow line would be uh, um, considered to be highly proliferative tumors and therefore would be candidates for receiving the additional chemotherapy. Okay, and you can see over here that the white ticks means that that patient did recur within five years. Black means they didn't recur. So, so these guys up here are these, these tumors, right? Um, uh, they're all basically good outcome and they're correctly predicted as such. If we use this yellow line here, you can see that there are some mistakes, right? So these are women that were undertreated, would potentially be undertreated, right? Because they would have been predicted by mammoprint to be of um, you know, good outcome. They, didn't, they wouldn't receive chemotherapy, but in fact, out, they in fact, they turned out to be poor outcome. Likewise, the, the white ticks over here means that the woman did recur within five years. So mammoprint you know, correct, per, correctly predicted that, right, the, um, the technique. Uh, but there are mistakes. And so these patients here were actually good outcome, even though they looked like poor outcome tumors at the beginning. And, and now, you know, I'll leave it to you, but, uh, you know, you should stop the video here and ask yourself what's a true positive, a true negative, a false positive, and false negative. And from that, you can calculate your sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Now, of course, th that yellow line, and you, you could ask, like, how did we set that, or how did uh, Vantavir and all, Vantavir et al. set that? Because we could move it. For example, if we moved it up here, we would have um, no false negatives. So there would be no cases where <coughs> a woman was predicted as good outcome, but she actually did recur. So we wouldn't have under-treatment, but we'd have quite a bit of over-treatment. So, so this gets into an issue now about um, a complicated issue about uh, how statistics uh, interfaces with the clinical utility of the device. So what is more acceptable to, uh, in terms of social economic benefit? Uh, for, you know, that includes the effect on the women and, and um, uh, it, the cost of everything, et cetera, on, on the healthcare system, uh, where you set this bar for deciding, um, are you going to tolerate more false positives or false negatives, right? So they did this, this figure down here. Um, so so I, what I should say here is that these 80 genes, 
are, are used bio, 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 in bioinformatically to predict um, uh, uh, whether the patient will be good or bad outcome. So this is really what's called a multi, like, like Oncotype DX, it's a multivariate gene panel predictor. Both Oncotype DX and Mamaprint don't rely on a single biomarker. They rely on a set of biomarkers. And, and there's lots of good reasons for that. And it's really maybe the defining feature of computational biology. Uh, computational biology is highly multivariate. We, we seldom are looking at a single gene or gene product and asking how well does it predict outcome or benefit from therapy or tumor progression. We're often looking at many genes together. Uh, and we can talk in class a little bit more about that to give you intuitions as to why. But I, just to leave it here, suffice it to say for here is, take a look at any one gene um, individually, like let's say the first person here, the first gene here. If I look just at that gene and not at sort of an average or, or a co combination of all of these genes, I would definitely make some mistakes. There's some green marks in here, okay? And there's also, well, not a lot of green marks. It's pretty good, but there are some black marks um, scattered about that could go either way in a sense, right? And I, I don't think there's any gene in this pool. Like if you look at this one here, it's very green, a couple of red marks there. Um, you know, it doesn't vary. There's not very much red. Uh, I, I think if you went through this uh, column by column, you would be really stretched to, I think you'd see that there are no perfect genes, right? That each gene makes quite a lot of mistakes. So, but maybe combining them, right? You know, gives us a certain redundancy. Um, it gives us more power essentially to correctly predict, you know, and that, that, you know, these small green guys might be biologically true. It may also be technical artifacts of the microarray, you know, just bad measurements on that particular sample, all sorts of things. Okay. So that was a really big step forward. And it was, it was a huge, um, both Oncotype DX and Mammoprint were huge successes for computational biology and genomics because they're, they're one of the first examples of how um, these fields made it to the clinic and found clinical utility. Now, Mammoprint is available, it's approved, and it's used largely in Europe. It's, it's essentially a competitor to Oncotype DX. Yeah. So uh, now we're going to switch over to um, our studio and we're going to sort of scale it back to uh, give you the principles of how we do this kind of multivariate analysis uh, in our breast cancer data. Um, okay, so I'll see you in a couple minutes. Let's take a look at supervised learning with some regression. Um, okay, it, it's a machine learning technique and uh, it's basically to predict the value of a continuous value, uh, a variable called uh, y, that we'll call y. Um, so it's supervised because we have examples where we know the answer y. Uh, y is usually a tip, uh, uh, ran, uh, some kind of real number, right? Something that uh, we want to predict, like let's say the number of days to death, etc. may not be exactly real, but it would be, um, might be more uh, kind of an integer, but uh, it's something that usually has, Y has a, a, a large range of values. Um, we're going to look actually next class at the case where Y is categorical. It has these discrete levels like, let's say, days of the week or good, bad, etc. And we're going to look at something that builds on top of regression called logistic regression that um, takes regression and then turns it into a, um, a discrete number of levels. So the, our goal here is to um, model Y, pr or predict Y, we could say, as a function of one or more attributes uh, given our design matrix X. And in particular, we're going to let these this matrix X define a, um, a line that and that line predicts the value of y. And so we have um, maybe one to n examples, and usually we assume that n is quite big. And each example has d dimensions, and that's um, something we should be comfortable with from last lecture with clustering, right? So this might be, each column might represent a different gene. So for example, this might be 50 genes or two genes, so d would be two. Um, and so each is each component, each vari variable or column is then a dimension. 
and we're, we want we have these examples where we we know the value of y given these these uh, different vectors for x. Okay, so um, uh, in our con in the context of R, we might think of these then as being um, uh, x and y being in a tibble. For example, uh, in our small bracket data set, uh, the columns the fifty columns corresponding to genes are the design matrix X and Y might be the, the number of days to I think the variable is called death days two, the number of days post diagnosis uh, where the woman died from the disease um, now we'll make a um, an assumption here that Y can be expressed as a linear function of X in general that isn't necessarily true you know, it may be that um, the different genes predict um, survival time in a very complicated nonlinear way but we're going to make a simplifying assumption that um, that they can be expressed as a line well, and I'll show you some examples pretty soon uh, so uh, what we want to do is build this equation and so that or this model so that we can predict future values of y that we haven't seen right so for example when a woman comes into the clinic and, and her, her um, tumor is biopsied, we would measure the variables um, 1 through D in that tumor and then use those variables to in the line, the model, to predict what Y would be and that would be the number of um, uh, days until death. And well, if that, I guess intuitively if Y is very small, right, the number of days is very short post-diagnosis, that would be indi indicative of an aggressive tumor and if it was very large it would suggest a more indolent tumor and that could for example um, affect clinical decision making in just this in the analogous way as Oncotype DX and Mammoprint um, that I previously described of course this is just a very simple model but um, something that's good to show uh, and, and motivate regressions okay so if d equals one, that means we're only looking at a single gene. Then um, that's pretty simple. That, that should be familiar to everyone here because this is just grade school algebra. Then the value of y for the ith example, right? That's our notation here, is equal to the slope of a line times the x component of that line. So that's just going to be the x of the ith example. Uh, there's only one column, right? So you could, you know, that's just this guy here. And this is your intercept, right? Y equals mx plus b, in other words, right? Um, but here we actually have this extra term called epsilon. And that's because we don't expect that the value of x, um, which is given, right? That's the measurement of a specific gene, let's say for ESR1. That times the slope plus the intercept is not going to exactly tell us the number of days to death we expect that there's some sort of error or randomness to this for this prediction and, and that's what this epsilon is now epsilon is not a variable like we've seen in the class uh, in R where it's an integer or a numeric it's a distribution okay so that's we would think of epsilon being a small amount of noise that we insert into this equation and I think Chris was asking about this last class so I'm going to get to the difference between equal and tilde in a second. And of course, from grade school algebra, we remember that B is usually the notation, I think, that most kids have for the intercept, and Y um, is the uh, slope of the line, right? So in, in general, in regression, we don't typically use B and M, um, and that's because we can have more than one dimension, right? We can have multiple dimensions. And so typically, this, this equation here is just rewritten with thetas, for example. Different, you know, people use different notation, but here it's kind of unifying because we use theta sub zero to represent B and theta sub one to represent M here, right? So if we had more dimensions, then we would just keep adding theta to theta three, theta four. And of course, this epsilon is still there. So this theta zero is B, that theta one is M, and that doesn't change. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, epsilon again is called a random variable and it allows a, a bit of noise to, to jiggle a point above or below the line, right? Okay, um, yeah, 
So we could think maybe, yeah, specifically often we would maybe suggest that epsilon is distributed according to a normal distribution with mean zero in standard deviation one. But, you know, that's not always the case. That, that would just be one um, example. So, but because it's not really equal uh, anymore, right? This, this epsilon adds stochastic or randomness. We, we don't really say that this ith example is, is equal to, to this. Instead, we, we, we think of this as being a distribution. Now, if I was to remove this part from the equation, right? Um, then I would just be saying that y sub i, the ith example of y, is modeled as, an, as a normal distribution 0, 1, right? That's Okay, so if we assume that is our error model, then y would just be a value, right, that's, that, that's a variant, what's called a variant from the distribution. So, so a variant is like, um, imagine that you have a distribution, normally distributed, mean zero, standard deviation one, and you turn to the distribution and say, give me a random value from your distribution. Now, a random here means that you pull according to that distribution. So you're likely, you know, the most of your values are going to be very close to zero in this, in this example. And they won't be minus seven or plus eight very, uh, with, well, maybe it's possible, but the tails of those distribution will be pretty tight because the standard deviation is only one. But you're going to mostly, if you keep asking for variate after variate from that distribution, what you're going to get back is something that looks very much like the normal distribution from zero to one. Now, I said here that we remove these parts. So it's clear that, well, that, and that's normal statistical notation to say that y sub i is modeled as or is, it follows the distribution according to epsilon, which is here we just again defined as normal with mean zero and standard deviation one. What this does is just change the mean of that distribution, right? So, and it indexes it by the value x. So if, if my um, value of x uh, i at one is five, then and my slope is one, that means that in my, in my let's say my um, intercept is three, that's just three plus five is eight. And so y sub i is now normally distributed around the value eight plus or minus a little bit of noise, right? Um, okay, so, we can read this tilde as meaning is distributed according to. Uh, you can explore in R uh, the normal distribution really easily. For example, here, uh, I can create a tibble very quickly by simply setting x to be R norm. I'm going to take a thousand variates from that distribution. So R is going to generate a thousand different values that are distributed normally with mean zero and standard deviation one. Now the R here, there's different versions of norm. Actually, all distributions in R have this nice similar notation. If I wanted the Bernoulli distribution, it would be Ber you know, like, uh, Bernoulli here. If I wanted the gamma, it would be gamma, etc. So there's lots of it. And then the R means that it's randomly generating examples from that distribution. So think of uh, the term variate as meaning uh, examples. Whoops, that's actually a thousand examples. And if I can summarize those examples, so that's just going to be epsilon's uh, dollar sign x, right? So notice that this is exactly what we've defined epsilon to be up here. This is what the distribution looks like. You can see it's centered on zero. And yeah, you get some values that are, you know, minus two and two, but not many, right? Most of your values lie between minus one and one. And that spread, that variance or the de um, standard deviation, that's controlled by this parameter here. The mean zero is just controlling that it's here, okay? Okay, so we can consider a very simple linear model that only has one attribute to predict the value of y. And um, that means it would just be this uh, theta zero, the y-intercept and theta one um, of the line. And so let's begin by simplifying our small bracket table, okay? So we don't need everything that we had in that very large data set. Here, I'm just going to filter the small bracket uh, for the tumor cases, all right? And then I'm going to select just those columns. Uh, okay, I'll put ID, vital status, that's dead or alive, basically. Um, death days two, that's the number of days until death post-diagnosis. And I'm going to keep all 50 genes at the end. That just gets rid of a lot of different columns. That's nothing new.
Um, right now, Death Days 2 uh, is a character because I didn't do a great job wrangling that data set in. So I need to make that to be a numeric. And um, I, uh, right in, in the data set, you, you could see if you explore it, that there's a, there's a, a character in the field called, um, uh, well, I think it's called vital status, right? A vital status. Uh, and it's instead of having NA that R would prefer, it has a character called not applicable. So I'm going to switch that to NA just to stay, uh, make things easier in um, uh, when I go to plot things. So that's, that's like this. I say SB, that's my data structure I saved up here. Is at death days two, I'm going to say, for example, I'm going to use an if else, which we haven't seen yet before. But this is a kind of a handy little shortcut for if statements, uh, if then else statements. So here, if else is really is if else is really simple. There's a boolean condition right here. So this this expression evaluates to either true or false. If this expression is true, the first um, uh, or the second field is executed. If this expression here is false, it skips this guy and executes the second part of the statement. So in this case here, what I'm saying is, if SB, if the entry of SB at death days two is equal to not applicable, I'm going to replace it by NA. Otherwise, if you look at that data, if you go back to R and you look at this column, you'll see that there's a character that's actually a number what I do is I just convert it to a numeric using the as.numeric of that um, SB death days two. And so what happens now is that SB death days two, when it was a number before, uh, but in a character format, it's now a numeric for, um, format or type. And um, wherever it said before not applicable, it now has an NA. Okay. Uh, now, I have to do one little thing here. Um, well, two things, really. Uh, the first is that um, you'll recall that almost all of our slides, we've logged the expression data. This is count data. And it really has a, 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 an exponential distribution. So some extremely high values and many small values. And so the way I, we deal with that is to log in the data. Okay, And that's a pretty standard statistical transformation. First, I basically I take SB. And I only look at those patients that have died. Okay, so I look at the vital status, and I filter on columns that are uh, represent patients who have died. And then for each column, uh, so now I'm going to use a for loop, which you guys now have seen. I'm going to go from one to fifty, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert. I'm going to I'm going to log transform all of the expression data. I'm going to do one other thing before, which is add a pseudo count plus one to every entry. And that's because for some tumors in some genes, we have a zero value. And so if I take the log of the zero value, I'm going to get problems with negative infinity. So to avoid that, what I'll do is I'll just add one to every um, gene in the matrix. It's not going to change anything drastically. It's just going to avoid that kind of um, that harsh uh, minus infinity that's going to cause problems with our um, statistics and visualizations downstream. So here, let's take a look at the for loop because we haven't had that much practice with them. Recall that we, we set a variable i, and that i is going to um, travel from 1 to 50. It's going to start off at equal to value 1, and it's going to go to 2, 3, etc., all the way to 50. Each time it's going to execute this body of code. In this case here, there's only one um, statement, and that says set the i plus 3th column of SB death. Right, that's that tibble there, equal to what it was before, SB death i plus three, but add one to that value and then take the log of it. Right, so I have compositions of functions there. Now I think the only thing that's maybe a bit confusing here, and I would recommend that you go back to the code and the data and play with it yourself, is that I'm saying i plus three, and the reason why I do that is because the first uh, three columns are, um, let me go back here, are ID, vital status, and death days two. We don't want to add one or log transform those, so I'm skipping over them, and I'm just going from basically columns four to 53, which are the 50 genes. Okay. Uh, after all of that, you'll see that we have 104 samples left. 
in um, SB death. So it's not a lot of data, but it's good enough for our examples here. So let's uh, we can begin by looking at a relationship of a gene that we've studied, talked about many times in the class, the estrogen receptor one, okay, and see what it, how it relates to death. So here I've plotted um, a scatter plot along here. Now this is the log transformed um, ESR one expression, and along the y-axis I have death days two. And so that means that the, these guys near zero um, are would be considered poor, uh, you know, aggressive tumors, right? That's quite poor outcome. A thousand days is basically, I guess, three slightly less than three years. Usually in breast cancer, five years is the magic number, so that would be somewhere around uh, here, fifteen hundred or so days. Uh, some of these uh, five thousand. Um, that the 3,000, for example, 500 would be 10 years. So this is very, this is 12 year data. So it's very long. So that, that's quite a good outcome up here because um, uh, that person lived almost something like 12 years post diagnosis. That, that's quite good. Uh, okay. So in this case, I would say this looks like a, perhaps a weak, I don't know, very weak, but a weak relationship. It does seem that. Um, you know, there is basically no great examples of success of good outcome when ESR levels are very low, although there's a couple. I would definitely think that there's some enrichment for poor, uh, for good outcome when ESR one levels are high. But there are also examples where uh, um, of, of patients who died quite quickly when they had very high levels of ESR one. So it's definitely not a perfect relationship between ESR one and time to um, time to death. Uh, but well, we can start with this and a linear regression. Now, what it does is it puts a line through that data. And then the question is what line? So the idea is that we want to find a trend in that data. And, and I think with ESR one here, it's a bit hard to see. But if you still really had to put a line through the data, um, it, it, you know, it, it's not clear exactly where it should go. But if I put it here, I would argue it's a bit too shallow because some points are below it. I would say more points are above it and their scatter is very high. To me, that seems too shallow. In other words, the slope sh that um, theta sub one should be um, more dramatic, larger value. And But if I did this and made it quite steep, I would say that's too steep because now too many of the points are below that line. Only a few are scattered above. Um, you know, it, it's true that there's more here, but they're more tightly concentrated. So, and they're, and they're further away, but they're sparse. So there is some, it may not be the worst line, but I think over here, it doesn't seem quite right. Only a few points are up there and quite a few points are down there. It seems too, too steep to me. Well, you know, so we could we could keep guessing at where that line should go, but of course that's not a very mathematical or, yeah, I mean it's not a very nice uh, systematic way of determining where that line should go. And of course for linear regression, there's extremely well understood approaches for uh, optimizing that line. And it turns out that in the, for mathematical reasons, uh, we often use the L two norm uh, for for fitting that line. And it, because it coincides with the maximum likelihood line. And I, that, if we were to do a second course, I would likely show you the proof that using um, this L2 norm uh, is how that works, how it basically it coincides with the maximum likelihood line. I, I'm just going to say here that uh, we, we discussed last class, for example, and other times in the course, why it's important to have probabilistic interpretations of your algorithms. And um, that's not when we say that it coincides with the maximum likelihood, why, why that's a good property is because it means that we can, when that line is drawn in a certain way, according to this so-called L2 norm principle, we can be assured that it's the most likely explanation of the data. And yeah, so that's a bit beyond the scope of this course. So we don't need to worry about that. We can just look more mechanically at what the L2 norm is. And uh, basically here, uh, what, what is computing is the distance of the observed value, which would be y sub i, that's for the ith example, that's y sub i, minus what our model predicts, right? 
that seems like a relevant thing, right? We have the observed value for the ith example, and then we have a value that we predict from our model for the ith value. And what is our model? It's that line that's determined by intercept theta sub zero and the slope theta sub m. So this is basically saying, given the attribute for x, which is the expression of one gene in this case, calculate where it sits along that line. So for example, we might predict, our line here would predict that this point here is actually on that line right there, right? And this point here would hit the line here. So this is y sub i, right? And that, that uh, y is basically equal to, I would say that's about what, 1700, okay? But our model is this red line here. So here, that model says that death days two should be just over 2000, right? About 2000, let's say 2100. So the real, the observed, that y sub i, that's equal to 1700. But this, that's our model value on the line. It hits there at the same height at about 2100. So now we have 1700 minus 2100, which is uh, minus 400, right? Doesn't matter about the minus because we're going to square it. And so that's 1600. And that's called the residual. The residual is 1,600 because it's the difference between our predicted value and the real value squared, okay? So another example would be here. This point here is your y sub i. It's the observed, and its value is basically 3,500. The, what we would predict from our model, if this was the correct line, it would be here, and that value is 2,700, say. So the difference is 3,500 minus 2,700. So I think that uh, that's 800. And we would square that value. So 800 squared, which is quite a lot. Now, if I use the other line, and I look at the same point here, its value, it's, it's now above this line in, in this model. And its value is 1,700, I think I said. And the predicted value is something like 700. So the, the residual here is about 1,000 squared. So for this point, at least, this model is worse than the two steep model, right? Because the difference here was much less than 1,000. Now you sum up over all of your points, of course, right? So the, the, the quality of this model or the quality of this model is, is basically, well, it is exactly the sum from the distance from all these points to the line, okay? So I could compute the total the residual sum of squares for this line, and I could compute the residual sum of squares for this line, and I would get two values. The smaller one is the better one, because uh, clearly if all of these points were sat right on the line, the distance between the observed and the predicted would be zero, and the square of zero is zero. So a perfect model, your residual mean squared would be zero. Okay, so again, you could say, well, I think a lot of people get uh, asked why, why, why squared, right? Like, why not just not have the squared there? Why not just y sub i minus um, the model, right, without squaring? That would be the L1 norm. Other people would ask, like, well, what about the L3 norm or the L4 norm? So, uh, I, I, again, so like the L2 norm has this nice property that, that coincides with our intuition of probability, maximum likelihood. Still, um, we might then say, uh, well, say, well, but why, why not L3 or something? So one interesting thing here is what does the, when you look at the L1 norm, which is removing that squared, just keeping it at one versus the squared, what happens is that the distance of a point to the line, right, is penalized more than when it's linear. So this distance from here to the line in, in, the, in, the, in the L2 norm, that, that distance is squared. But in the L3 norm, it's even bigger because it's cubed, right? In the L4 norm, it's even, even more. So, it, so basically, as your norm goes up, um, your penalty for the, for the gap between observed and your model, uh, the, the, those, those penalties get higher and higher. There's even something called the L infinity norm, which is essentially just the maximum of any point 
from the line. I think that would be this guy here. And essentially, that the, re the L infinity norm is just saying, um, it, it just, if you keep square, you know, if you go from the square to cube to quadratic, et cetera, uh, to, to um, power four, power five, and you go to the limit, ultimately what you're doing is just basically penalizing the model for it's further, the point furthest away from the line. Okay, but the L2 is often used, and I think it's, it's a, a good place to start in your exploration here. Okay, so uh, I just guessed here a third time, is this the right um, line here? I've just changed, I, I've used the, um, I should note here that I've used this AB line um, function in ggplot where I set the intercept and, and the slope uh, and uh, plot the line this way. That's just also another guess that maybe looks a bit better than the previous too steep or too shallow. Okay, so really the question is, how, how do we algorithmically find the optimal line? And that, again, is um, defined as minimizing the LT norm over all of our data points. In this case here, we only have one dimension, but n points. So x11 to xn1, that's this only column. Sorry, I don't make, want to make you dizzy, but to all the way back, all of our points are here in this first column, okay? Now, uh, let me explain this equation. Um, it looks far more complicated than it really is. This says here that for each, for each point from i equal to one to n, I sum up the difference between uh, the observed value and my model value, right? So that's exactly this equation up here that we just talked about, okay? And we square it just like we talked about up here, all right? So all that's changed is basically I've said that here, I've, I've, I've calculated the distance from each point to the line all over it. I square it. So that means, notice that when I square it, it doesn't matter if the point is above or below the line anymore, right? And at the end, all I, the only thing that's new here is that at the end of it, I take the square root. And if I, then the question is, so what does it mean then to solve this, right? And that takes, you should stop the video for a little bit and try to think about it. But what are our unknowns here? We know n, that's for sure. We know our observed value y because this is supervised learning. And we know our attribute variables x, the design matrix. So they're all known, right? What we don't know are these two parameters here, theta sub 0 and theta sub 1. And it's those two parameters that define this red line, or a red line just like it, right? So what we're trying to solve here, it, it, when we say we're trying to solve this equation, what we're trying to do is find the values for theta sub zero and theta sub one that minimize this overall square root of sums. In other words, it's the line that's going to be sort of satisfy all these points simultaneously the best, right? Okay. And I could explain in, a, in, a, in an advanced course, like I said, we would go through how you can solve that very quickly with least squares. But in R, there's a nice function called LM for linear model that does this for you. And it's really easy to use. In this case here, I call linear model with uh, death days two um, modeled as ESR one, right? So here, now I think this is Chris, I, I, especially Chris, who was asking about this in the last lecture. What I'm trying to say here, let, let's, let's, take a, let's take a slow look at this. Okay, first let, let's get this out of the way. I'm just, this, this second part here says data is equal to SB death, that's just, um, that's just our tibble, right? That where I filtered and, and modified everything. That's the same SB death that's all the way through here. And it was defined right here with the log adjusted um, count matrix. Okay, so that hasn't changed, but let's go back to here and ask what is the relationship between our linear model and our genes now? And essentially what we're saying now is that death dates two, which is y, right? That's our outcome, right? Our response variable is modeled as theta sub zero plus theta sub one. And now what's x in our model? That's ESR one's expression. Okay, and in this epsilon is taken care of by the linear model itself. 
And so what the LM function does is minimize that, that equation we just looked at and returns the thetas of zero, the intercept, and thetas of one, which is the um, slope. So for example, here you'll see death days two, that's my y, is modeled as x, right? And that in our case here, this is the x, corresponds to ESR one expression. I don't need to explicitly put in theta sub zero plus theta sub one here. The LM function knows what I mean and fills those things in, in, in for me. When I, when I, do, uh, when I print out the result my, of my fitting to the, the data, you can see here as I get the intercept. So that means the line hits the y-axis at around 900 and my slope is 72.76. Let's go back up here to this example. Um, notice here that this point here is 2.5. It's not zero along the x-axis. So it would be around here that it hits the x, uh, hits the y, um, sorry, hits the x-axis, right? This line would have to extend out and this is 2.5. So I guess zero is around the edge here, um, maybe even a bit further. So uh, I think this line is pretty close, right? So the intercept that my model says is around 900. So I guess it's a little bit, the optimal is a little bit higher here. And the slope is 72.76. So that's a bit harder to compute here, but five to 10 is five units. And so that means you, you would rise five times 72, I believe, so, so around 350. So that would go from zero to around here. Um, so if it came in at 900 uh, down here, I would expect, I guess, uh, well, it's a bit confusing, I guess, but here, you, I guess it's not too far off. I guess this is a little bit too steep still, um, according to this mean, uh, this slope and this intercept. Um, and I can look at, I, if I use summary, I can look at other parameters of the fit. For example, here, I can see that the um, intercept and the, uh, is, is significant, and that means the theta zero is necessary, uh, at least at P 0 0.05. The ESR one slope is not significant, but overall, the p-value from our oh, our p-value from our model is not significant at 0 0.05. It's uh, 0.128, uh, which means that we can't re reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis here would be that um, there is not a relationship, a linear relationship between um, uh, the time to death and ESR one expression levels. So formally here. Uh, and I think if you have a biostats course, then you know this pretty well about how these p-values are computed, et cetera, and what they mean. But for us, a very, very naive um, approach here is that this p-value is not below 0 0.05. And that would suggest that um, the mathematics says that, that the optimal align, the optimal line, the one that's defined here, that's close to this line that I drew by hand here is not significant. Um, and we cannot conclude that um, ESR1 is a good predictor of the of survival time. Okay. But I think we kind of see that um, more or less by just looking at the point. This is actually the optimal line here. I've, I've put in the intercept at AB line. I put in the true intercept from the model and the slope from the model and drawn it. So you can see that basically, if you focus on these three points and these three points, and I come down here, it's a little bit more shallow and it approaches there highly. That's the optimal line, but the optimal line is not significant. Uh, oh, sorry, this was cut off a little bit, but this says that P is greater than 0 0.05, what was written there. Okay, so what about progesterone receptor? Uh, that's a different, you know, we tried ESR1, but why not progesterone? So we could do the same thing really quickly. Here we're setting up our model it's saying Y is modeled as um, a line, line from theta sub zero plus theta one time progesterone receptor levels, okay? And uh, when I do that, uh, I can come down here and see that my p-value now is actually well below 0 0.01, so, 
um, or 0 0.05, remaining consistent with the previous analysis. So this, mathematically at least, looks to be a significant um, uh, relationship between progesterone expression levels and, and survival time. To back up here, we can see that um, the, uh, well, okay, there's the um, slope and uh, intercept, but I plotted that here. Uh, I've just pulled from my fit, which is what I set the linear model to be equal to. I extracted um, the coefficients one and two, which is the, this is the, the, the intercept and this is the slope, and that's the optimal line there. And it concludes that that is a significant relationship between progesterone levels and outcome. Okay, so in, I think that you can might agree with me that it looks a little bit better than ESR1. Um, yeah, you know, ESR1 has, it looks promising, but it, it's not significant. And this one, yeah, it, 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 like you, you can sort of see this upward trend in these points here, right? That, so that means basically that uh, the higher the expression level of progesterone this way, the longer time to death. So this is good outcome patients, and these are poor outcome patients. At the same time as that this being significant, I think we also agree that this is far from a perfect relationship between progesterone and, um, and time to death. So we could still improve on that. Well, in fact, of the 50 genes that we have, others are significant, including BCL2. That's an apoptosis-related gene. In fact, I put a link down here um, to uh, BCL2 at um, Gene Cards if you're interested in understanding a little bit about this B-cell lymphoma apoptosis regulator and why it might be related to um, cancer. In fact, it's a, it's a, it is a very key gene in cancer development uh, and loss of B BCL2 uh, is not a good thing. Okay, so what, I'm, what, what I did here is I, I used a little for loop to just compute a linear model for each of our 50 genes instead of going through one by one. So first I start off with a vector called my fit that's empty. And now I'm gonna loop through from four to 53. So that again, I'm skipping the first three columns. I thought I would show you a slightly different way to do it here. So I just explicitly only allow I go from, I to go from four to 53. In the previous example, I let I go from one to 50, and then I added three down here. Same thing, just two different ways to do it. But here, initially I will be four, which is the first gene, which I believe is aniline. And what I do here is I build, um, I just uh, create a string here that says, death days two modeled as um, the ith name in SB death, which is gonna be aniline. And so I'm just doing some fancy R here. What that's gonna look like is death days two is modeled as the expression of aniline. And that's the analog of what I did up here, where I wrote explicitly death days two is assigned, uh, is modeled as PGR. And this one up here, which of course is the death days two is modeled the ESR one. Here I'm doing something a little bit fancy. Uh, it's convenient to do it this way because I can loop through all 50 genes. First, I create a character, a string called model, that's death days two modeled as aniline in the first case when I is equal to four. And then what I do is I pass this to the linear model. I'll save the result as TMP. But here I take that character, that string called model, and I coerce it into a formula, which is a type in R. So I would recommend that you stop the video and try that in our studio and make sure that you understand these two lines of code. But that passes then this, this character that says death days two is modeled as aniline. It switches it into a formula and passes it to the linear model function. And now I get back um, a, a linear fit. And now what I've done is this statement here, it just pulls up the p-value that we've been looking at for that linear model and assigns it to the ith element of the vector my fit. And then you hit the end of the, the body of the for loop and it goes back. Now I will be equal to five. And so the second gene in our set is called um, FOXC1. And so it's gonna, model is now going to be equal to 
the string called death days two with the second element of the names of SB death, right? So that's going to be at Fox C1. And then again, it passes it through there, builds the linear model. Then I, I extract the p-value and it goes back up and does it for the, 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 the um, uh, fifth, the sixth position now, CDH3. It does that for all of them, all 50. And then at the end of it, I just assign, assign names and I print my fit. And you can see that the first three are empty because I didn't compute linear models for the ID, for uh, the tumor um, status, etc. Only here from the first gene to the last gene, I get the p-value representative of the quality of the fit. And I can reject the null hypothesis in a few cases. Uh, where's the first one here? At p0.05, ptgg1, which I actually don't know what that is, is significant. BCL2, as I said above, is significant. RRM2 is significant, uh, et cetera. I think there's a few more in here if you go through. Some of them are definitely, MIC, for example, is significant down here too. So now that, that means I've created a linear model for every gene univariately, and I think about five or six of them are considered to be statistically significant predictors of time to recurrence in, in breast cancer. But many of them aren't individually. Now there are other issues here. I've computed 50 models and I haven't corrected for multiple testing. So if you remember back in class, I gave examples of how if you went to a hockey game and everybody was to guess um, a sequence of heads and tails of length 10 or 12 or whatever it was, if you have a lot of people, you would expect somebody to actually get it right just by random because you know if you have enough kicks at the can, somebody eventually will get it right. And really here, I should be correcting for that multiple testing. I, I found, I've tried 40 different gene, uh, 50 different genes. Uh, it's perhaps not surprising that um, at p-value of 0 0.05, which is one in 20, that I would get maybe two or two and a half to be significant. Uh, that wouldn't be too surprising actually, just by chance. Uh, well, that's a little bit beyond the scope of the course, although those are very important concepts that should be covered in a biostats course and are really part of our daily life in bioinformatics of, of correcting for these kinds of uh, multiple testing. Okay, so one good uh, thing for you to think about as a point of reflection is how would you validate this model and what are our different options? So, you, you know, it's all fine and well for me to say, I believe that BCL2 or PGR expression predicts time to recurrence, but that's, that's I've used all the data here to do that. Um, how would I then try to test this uh, out and really kick the tires to see if it generalizes, right? Whether it's actually predictive. So um, yeah, I think that we can talk about that in class, right? I, I'd like you to think about a little bit of how you would validate something like this. All right, but as we talked about at the beginning of the class with Oncotype DX and Mammaprint, the real power here comes from using multivariate analysis. Instead of looking at just one gene at a time, we want to combine multiple genes. So um, just to recall here, we've just looked only at ESR, PGR, or each of the 50 genes in isolation. So that's our design matrix only has one column to date. But really then, how do we combine multiple genes together. Now, in Mammoprint, for example, I showed you that no single gene was you know, a perfect predictor of, of outcome. Um, and, uh, but together, they did a pretty good job of, of um, predicting the outcome. So how do we combine all those different measurements together into one estimate, right, one prediction of uh, the time to um, death? Now, uh, right, so um, we're going to start here by building on top of PGR, uh, but we'll think first about combining it with BCL2. And so we'll just use two genes for today because it, we could use more. Oncotype DX uses 21, um, Mammoprint uses around 80, I believe. Uh, and uh, I should point out that our 
a small BRCA data set has 50 genes in it, and those 50 genes correspond to PAM50. It's neither the oncotype DX gene nor the um, gene set, nor the mammoth print gene set, but there is overlap, of course, some, actually quite a few genes in common between all three of those sets, which I guess isn't surprising because they're all major players in breast cancer progression. So here, uh, this is what it looks like. It looks like a complicated um, equation, but really it's nothing. So this is our outcome. Death days two is modeled as, so nothing's changed. Theta sub zero, our intercept, nothing's changed. Plus theta sub one, the slope times x one, nothing's changed. That would, would be for PGR. What's changed here is we've got another slope, theta two times um, the second component, right? Now, if we had K genes, we would just keep adding another slope for each of the K genes, right? So theta sub K times um, the value the I, of the ith example, uh, the Kth genes, and our good old epsilon at the end not changed. So really here, uh, in, we've only added um, one um, component, which is for uh, BCL2, but the structure of the equation hasn't changed. And now we have k plus one parameters because, of course, we have uh, uh, the theta zero, so k genes plus a theta zero. All right, so uh, our equation then specifically looks more like this, where death days two is modeled as the intercept plus a slope of um, for PGR1 and a slope for BCL2 plus noise. So we can think of this uh, theta, theta one and theta two as kind of a weight, I guess. So it's a weighted amount of PGR1 and a weighted amount of BCL2. Think, I think that's a, a handy way to think of it, right? So they, um, uh, they have perhaps different um, uh, com contributions to uh, our estimate of the total uh, time to recurrence. And, and now our model that we pass to the LM function, well, the result will be um, set equal to fit LM, Again, this data doesn't change, but here our model is death days two. And the way I express this equation, it's just, it looks like this. Death days two is modeled as PGR plus BCL2. And that fills that R knows that um, with the function LM, I mean a linear model. And it, and it puts those thetas in all by itself. Okay. And when I do that, I get back this report. And now I can see that there's an analysis statistical for the intercept for PGR and for BCL2. If I look down here at the p-value, it's gone down quite a bit compared to the model for either BCL2 or PGR1, or PGR, sorry, in isolation. In fact, I'm going to come back up to here just to show you that. Where is PGR uh, and BCL2? This is BCL2. It's, well, 0.068. So it's not a dramatic de decrease, that's for sure. And, um, oh, PGR is actually 0 0.01. Actually, I don't think I realized that. So um, in fact here, overall, the p-value, it's significant for sure. Um, it hasn't actually dropped from the value of PGR, right? So, but definitely the right interpretation of the p-value here is that we can reject the null hypothesis that that these variables are independent and they don't predict um, uh, the, number, the time to recurrence, but it seems that they in fact do. Now it, it's, it's hard in ggplot to visualize that. Uh, in the code, um, in, the, um, repos in the project on RStudio Cloud, I've commented out some code for, uh, in the file, this is called, um, yeah, what is it called? It's the regression NV in, in the source directory. At the bottom, there's code for using GG3D. Right, so this is called the RGL package in R uh, that I installed. Um, yeah, the code is there, it's commented out. So here you can see a little bit better the relationship of, uh, uh, for the number of days to death, that's a long this axis here, okay, you can see that that's this axis, and uh, BCL2, which is along this axis here, and PGR, that's not a bad visualization there. So you can see that the vertical axis here is the time to recurrence. So 
These guys here are poor outcome, right? Because they're um, very close to zero, right? That to towards zero, I mean, I'm sorry. And then PGR, uh, that doesn't tell you too much. In that dimension, if I zoom over here, you can see that um, as PGR expression goes up, you get better outcome, right? Because the death days two is there. And BCL2 expression is in this dimension. So as its expression goes up, I think it's also, you can see it's, um, there's BCL2's expression along this axis. You see that it's going up uh, also. Uh, so the higher the BCL2 expression, the higher PGR expression, uh, the longer um, it, the time to death, so the better outcome. So, okay, so for example, that one there is just BCL2 expression. And, you can see that's time to outcome here. So you can see a kind of linear relationship, but it's not perfect. PGR adds something to that um, here. That's the PGR perspective, I guess, where this is increased PGR expression and that's increased time to outcome. So yeah, the two of them define kind of a plane here, uh, a hyperplane. That would be like a, a plane that cuts through the space. And that's, that's the, the model that we were just talking about. So I'll let you play with that um, on your own time to get an idea. Uh, but the idea, of course, I, I think the intuition, though, of these multidimensional um, uh, models is that BCL2 might kind of fail, uh, let's say fail or be noisy on one sample, but PGR could rescue it and vice versa. Sometimes PGR may be kind of noisy or not playing, uh, not, not very informative but BCL2 will pick up the, the, the slack in essence. Okay.